It's my great honour to welcome you all. It is a very prestigious award. It means the world to me. They have great senses of humour. I like to reveal parts of history to them for I love making history come alive. They are some of the best people that you can come across. To help them open their hearts. I always come back to this quote. How can we be role models to learners if we're not learners ourselves? It's quite useful to get out of our bubbles, not our COVID ones, and sort of see what else is out there. By sharing best practice, we can see the whole picture. We can see what really matters. One of the biggest brains around. It's easy to forget how much has to happen behind the front lines. As a global schools group, Cognita educates over 55,000 students across 12 countries. We're proud to be wellbeing partner at this year's Festival of Education and we want to share the work that we're doing to prioritise children's well-being. This starts with a clear understanding of what well-being is. We looked at the evidence and created a simple Be Well Charter that everyone can use day to day. It gives a clear definition of well-being and then focuses on the specific contributors that influence it. Discover our full Be Well Charter video and other resources to use with your students and families at cognita.com. I really try to not look at myself as just a science teacher. I feel like as a teacher, it's, it's very important to help students grow and develop outside of your lessons. A single teacher believing in you and really believing in you. One teacher doing that can have a large impact, but if you have one or two or three all telling you that and really, really believing in it, it makes you feel like you can achieve anything in the world, honestly. Welcome to this Festival of Education keynote session, part of the annual Festival of Education, taking place online from the 16th to the 30th of June. This year's festival is free for all teachers and educationalists across education in the UK and beyond. This has only been possible thanks to the support of our incredible partners. A huge thank you to our headline partner, Pearson. Our festival partners, BBC Bite Size, Cognita and Teach First. Our literary festival partner, Bloomsbury Publishing.
and our organising partner, Wellington College, the home of the Festival of Education. We'd also like to thank our incredible speakers. Over 200 leading educationalists and thought leaders will be providing sessions at this year's festival. On behalf of the audience and organisers, thank you. It's time to sit back and get set for our upcoming keynote session. If you wish to ask a question during this session, please head over to our Slido page to submit questions and vote for your favourites. Enjoy this Festival of Education keynote session. Hello everyone, um, I'm delighted, you to, um, delighted to welcome you to this seminar where we're asking how can schools support early and preventative interventions for young people. My name is Will Millard and I'm Head of Engagement at the Think and Action Tank, the Centre for Education and Youth. This is the second of four sessions in CFEY's Festival of Education seminar series, exploring the four key messages from our book, Young People on the Margins. The book explores some of the reasons that young people face marginalisation, both in school and in wider society. The first key message from our book is that being on the margins isn't the same as being marginalised. And this was explored in a session yesterday, chaired by my colleagues, Abby and Vanessa. They were joined by a group of young people, each with lived experience of overcoming barriers to learning and accessing support. The Children's Commissioner, Rachel D'Souza, offered her reflections during the session and she highlighted the importance of understanding young people's individual stories. Again, a, a key uh, message, I think, from our, our book as well. On June 28th, my colleague Baz is chairing a panel discussion examining what can be done about child poverty. CFUY's book shows just how crippling poverty can be for young people and their families. And it calls for immediate action on this. Baz's stellar panel features Nahida Maharansingham, a head teacher in Lewisham and a CFEY fellow, the Social Mobility Commission, Sammy Wright, Zoe McIntyre for the, from the Right to Food campaign, and May Lim, director of Reach Children's Hub. So that's June 28th at uh, 12.30. The third key message from our book stresses the importance of demarginalising schools so that we do not rely on schools alone to tackle society's most challenging issues. CFUY's Chief Executive Loic Menzies will be joined on the 29th by speakers including UK Youth CEO Ndidi Okazi and Ofsted's Head of Strategy Anna Trithui. Professor Sam Twizzleton from Sheffield is also going to be, Sheffield Hallam, I should say, is also going to be joining us uh, for that session. They will be discussing whether schools can do everything and uh, for risk of a spoiler alert, uh, clearly they can't. So the focus for the panel will be discussing what this means for how we think about education and the support we give young people. I encourage you to join those sessions, uh, which promise to be illuminating and insightful. So to today's seminar, I'm joined by a brilliant panel, and we're going to discuss the fourth uh, message from CFEY's book. We're going to discuss how schools can intervene early in young people's lives to reduce the need for more drastic and reactive interventions further down the line. I'm sure we can all think of times when early support helped keep a young person in our care on the right track. Or perhaps we can think of opportunities missed when early preventative steps weren't taken. Or perhaps you can think of a time you saw early support for a young person, but this support wasn't forthcoming because the young person hadn't met some threshold of need. I'm thrilled to introduce our fabulous panel. I genuinely can't think of four people a uh, better place to tackle this uh, complex uh, area of discussion. Catherine Roche is CEO at the charity Place to Be, a charity providing mental health services in schools for over 25 years. 
Claire Heald is the Deputy Chief Executive of Inspiration Trust, overseeing its schools and the work of the central education team, including curriculum and teacher development. Claire is a trustee for The Difference, uh, and I'll leave it to Claire to say a little more about that. Um, and she is also a CFUY fellow. Christina, Christina Adone is the Head of Family Policy Unit at the Think Tank, the Centre for Social Justice. She is the founder of Parenting Circle Charity and author of Concentrated Parenting. Christina brings her particular knowledge of the children's social care system and I'm particularly uh, you know, excited to pose, uh, to hear what Christina thinks about that particular aspect of uh, our public service. Uh, and finally, my colleague Vanessa Joshua, who anyone attended our session yesterday will instantly recognise, uh, also joins us. Vanessa joined us from, joined the Centre for Education and Youth, I should say, from the Centre for Social Justice, where she had been conducting research into exclusions. Vanessa previously worked as teaching assistant in primary and secondary schools and has a particular interest, as I say, in exclusions, but also in uh, special educational needs. So a very warm welcome to our four panellists. As I say, I can't think of four better people to be here and to be discussing this issue. I'm now going to ask each panellist to speak for up to five minutes, outlining two things. Uh, what happens when early intervention is used effectively? And what happens when opportunities for early intervention are missed? To our audience, um, please feel free to share questions, comments, observations on Slido. Um, I will be uh, looking at that and posing your questions to the panel as those come in. So, um, Catherine, over to you. Um, what are your thoughts on uh, early intervention when used effectively and when those opportunities are missed? Um, thank you, Will. So, place to be, our whole focus is about early intervention and prevention and being able to do that based at the heart of school communities. And so, when I thought about this question, I'll take just one example of um, a, a child Matthew, who, who placed to be worked with uh, in one of our schools uh, in Scotland a number of years ago. Matthew it was eight years of age when his school, his class teacher referred him to place to be. He has a, 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 brother, was a brother and his mum is a single mum and is raising both of them alone. And it's incredibly, they live in incredibly challenging circumstances. Um, and his mom is under a lot of stress and uh, has turned to alcohol as one way of actually dealing with this. Matthew, in his own words, has described it as like having two moms. So there's a mom who he comes, who sees him off in some cases in the morning, loving mom who is supportive. There's also mom who he can come home to after school where he tiptoes up the stairs and he's terrified of disturbing her. And he says, avoid her at all costs. And he talks about consistency and trust was completely lacking and missing. It was a, a case of, it was traumatic and unpredictable. Those are the words he used to describe home life and also in school, he just couldn't connect, couldn't concentrate, couldn't be there in a classroom. So his class teacher spotted this, referred him to place to be who has an on-site mental health professional and we were able to then understand and together very much in partnership with the school, unpick and understand a bit more about what was going on for him. Matthew describes um, his time at Place to Be as a place to go and talk about problems and feel safe and gave him that consistency and trust, which he's carried throughout life. We were able to get access for support for mom and address some of the issues. Um, and then in longer life, you know, it wasn't plain sailing even after he left primary school, but he says deep inside him, he knew he was worth it. And that was, he always held on to the strength to talk and reach out and ask for support when he needed it. Matthew is now 21 years old. He's uh, an IT analyst within, a, within Standard Life Aberdeen in Scotland. And he is proud to be an ambassador with lived experience of place to be services and really communicates that far and wide. I think that is where early intervention really, it shows it really, really can work. 
I think Matthew is one of 5,000 children that we work with on an annual basis every year right around the country in schools and that's just the schools a place to be is in there are many other organizations who can do this I think where it doesn't work we've done some research to look at um, the cost of not intervening early and you invest one pound in a place to be service the return is six pounds twenty and that is improved outcomes from reduced rates of truancy I'm sure Claire will talk more about that and exclusion reduced smoking depression crime and higher rates, better life chances. One of our trustees yesterday, um, Anuja Deer, is a high court judge who sits at the Old Bailey. The reason she has become involved in Place to Be is because she said she sees too many children who come into her court, um, young juveniles who are in court for really serious offences, where she sees that could have been prevented and addressed and stopped early on. Um, and that's why we've got to we've got to turn this around, and we can. And there's my case for early intervention. Thank you very much indeed, Catherine. Um, yeah, really powerful sets of examples that you shared about place to be's important work in this respect. Um, Claire, can I come to you next? Mm, hi everyone. Uh, this is such an interesting question. Um, as, as Will said, I'm coming at this from the perspective mainly of um, being a, a leader in a multi-academy trust and thinking about school context. But um, I also see the other side of the importance of early intervention through um, my work being a trustee at The Difference, which is a charity that seeks to reduce um, preventable exclusions in schools uh, and is doing great work in that area. Um, but thinking about examples of when this goes right and when it doesn't um, I'll, I'll draw on some school examples and in my experience when this works really well when there's opportunities are seized for early intervention um, it's nearly always about getting positive relationships right and knowing children really well and and really knowing them as individuals not just what it says on their file um, and also getting communication right between all the um, adults that are, are working with a particular young person. Um, I can think of lots of examples, but I wanted to share one which also speaks to an important point about transition. Um, I believe really firmly that, although it's not always the case, more often than not, when opportunities are either um, seized or missed, this can happen at transition points. And there are multiple points which we might consider to be such in, in um, the educational life of a child. Um, so um, I'm thinking about one particular example of a child that was uh, transitioning from a nursery setting to reception, so starting school. The nursery staff had started to notice um, some challenging behaviour, some uh, sensory issues, and particularly that this um, child found larger groups challenging uh, and they could see distress and anxiety manifesting in these situations. They realised that this was something that could impact on effective transition to, to primary school and um, the early years reception setting. Um, they raised that with the school's uh, parent support advisor, the SENCO and the reception team, started that communication between the key worker and reception staff that meant they were able to start building the school started to build a relationship with the family and a proper transition plan could be written um, that was mapped in cons consultation with the family and also in view it, it involved the the feelings of the child which is key um, they that transition plan considered training that might be, might be needed for staff um, multi-agency support uh, and a really good plan was put in place so that staff knew how to meet the child's needs. The staff felt uh, that the parents were involved and that the child felt happy about moving up to school. That child is now really thriving and doing really well uh, in reception and about to move into year one next year. Um, and that's just the kind of example of when it, when early intervention co can work well, when needs and issues are identified early and that information is shared in a timely way with the right people. Um, so what about when that doesn't work so well? And sadly, I think we've probably all seen that, that it, it doesn't always happen. Otherwise, we wouldn't be having this conversation today. 
I think an important thing to say is it's important to talk about when it doesn't and reflect because if we don't then then the important learning doesn't happen and I firmly believe that all schools intend and want to do the best for their for their young people but they don't always know how and sometimes their systems and, and school cultures might not be set up in in the way that best facilitates early intervention and identification of need um, I think common factors that might be indicators of it of this not working well are when not enough emphasis is placed on the knowledge of individual children and that can be particularly a challenge with transition to secondary um, when you haven't got that important gate time and the class teacher having that holistic view um, of the child when communication doesn't work so attendance teams aren't talking to pastoral teams aren't talking to parents aren't talking to the form tutor when there isn't joined up thinking in the systems in school that um in schools that facilitate that it can be a lack of expertise schools not knowing what to do um or a genuine challenge is lack of funding um and something that i'm sure will come up is when maybe a threshold of need isn't met which means funding can't be accessed unfortunately until things escalate and get far worse um, and, and that's a real shame um, when the systems aren't in place in a school to identify needs so that early intervention doesn't happen because people actually don't ask the questions why the right assessments aren't undertaken to actually you know identify um, that unmet need and and the consequences of early intervention being missed are of course that once things escalate and get worse it can be far harder to intervene successfully um, and this can this, this will have a real and significant impact on on the on our young people's on young people's lives um, leading to you know we will all know disengagement with school um, escalation of, of issues and behavior probably leading to low or, or non-attendance um, exclusion leading to further social exclusion and then of course um, underachievement and often impact on um, well-being and mental health. Thank you Claire, really um, really valuable insight from your role um, in the schools that you're, you're working in. Um, so Christina, um, if I can come to you next, um, your thoughts on this? Uh, thank you Will. For the past year, I've been absolutely immersed in research into how we can safely keep children from going into care. And uh, without going into the care system, we've got uh, today the first part of Josh McAllister's government-led review uh, of uh, the children's care system. So we'll, let, we'll leave that to one side. But what I found was there were some amazing examples of schools uh, taking early intervention very seriously and managing, you know, nothing short of miraculous with the children in need and children in care they were working with. And one particular example was in Rochdale. Uh, I met with Joe Manfred, uh, who is the Skills and Partic Participation Development Officer for the Rochdale Council. And she said that about 13 years ago, they realized as a council that the number of NEAT uh, in the, the borough was going you know, spiraling. So they called a head, head teachers conference and uh, urged head teachers to take this seriously and put a member of their senior leadership team in charge of uh, career advice. They then put into, uh, into each school a management, an information management system that tracked uh, any child who was neat or any child who was vulnerable. This allowed them to have one-on-one -on -one career advisors spending time with the, those children whom they'd spotted as having difficulties. And, and this comes back to, uh, Claire and Catherine's uh, stressing of how important building that 
a continuous trusted relationship with a grown-up is, but also knowing the students in your school, knowing uh, which families hide uh, all kinds of crises, which families are struggling. And by just keeping uh, a very uh, careful monitoring of those students who were viewed as most, most vulnerable, the career advisor was not only able to raise their aspirations, but to actually follow through, you know, down to uh, when you have your first interview, you must look them in the eye, you must shake their hands. Uh, do you have appropriate clothing for that first interview, et cetera, et cetera. So very practical, very, um, uh, very simple in a way, but absolutely life transforming. And in Rochdale, it has reduced uh, the number of need dramatically. So that was one of the chinks of hope and light. Uh, unfortunately, one of the big issues for anybody who deals with uh, vulnerable children is, our, uh, is a mindset that identifies the child as a kind of autonomous being, absolutely divorced from any relationship, uh, not seen at all in terms of their parental needs. Now, given that 98% of children who end up in care are there because of their parents' needs, not because of their own misbehavior, this suggests to me that the system is, uh, is really quite uh, flawed uh, in its attitude. So because social workers and teachers uh, and many of the people who are uh, dealing with children in, uh, who are vulnerable do not ask about what family relationships are like and do not ask, uh, you know, uh, where are you living? Uh, what, is, what is your uh, parents' relationship with one another? We had uh, one terrible example of, uh, of a young man who uh, has contributed to a set of essays uh, that in fact uh, our very own Will has contributed to and which will be published tomorrow online uh, for, at the Center for Social Justice. And his harrowing account of having been abused and of nobody asking him why it was that at age 11, he was drinking himself into blackouts on a consistent level. So of course he was taken into care and he was uh, completely um, uh, left, to, left to a system that you know, in his case really didn't help. But what we saw was the child was misbehaving in the classroom. The child was um, uh, acting up, being a disruptor. Yet nobody dared to ask him, what is your family like? And by not asking that question, they left him and cons consigned him to uh, uh, many years of care, which proved not very helpful in his case. So uh, like, all, uh, like all the panelists so far, I also think that the key is that consistent, trusted relationship that asks the right questions and waits for all the answers. Thank you, Christina. Really, really useful overview of some of the challenges uh, that face both schools and children's care. Um, finally, Vanessa, can I come to you? Um, yeah, sure. Thank, thank you. you. Um, I might start with the second question first in terms of what happens when early intervention is missed. So I guess for me, when we think about early intervention, what we're fundamentally talking about is putting in place interventions early in a young person's life to make sure that they don't have poor outcomes at any point in the future. So for me, when we're thinking about um, what happens when we miss the opportunities to put in place early interventions, I think what we're fundamentally thinking about is bad outcomes. So for me, anytime a young person is excluded, gets involved with the criminal justice system, becomes homeless, neat, um, has extreme circumstances with their mental health, I think for me, fundamentally, it's, it's always a case of early intervention has been missed. Um, I think it's key to remember that no young person is destined to be excluded or to end up in the criminal justice system. I think often it's a breakdown of systems or a young person kind of falling through the net, not getting the support that they need. So 
with that being said, kind of, I want to pick up on the points that other people said in terms of what, um, sorry, the exact question was, um, what happens when an early opportunity is seized? Um, I think fundamentally it's about under, understanding the students' needs. Um, and as Claire mentioned previously, it's about making sure that we're asking the, the right questions. Um, so I come from a place of um, doing research in the area and also having my own personal experiences of exclusion, um, being excluded twice and ended up um, doing my GCSEs at Peru. And I think for me, a lot of the time, the right questions weren't being asked. It wasn't a case of why is her behavior constantly bad? It was a case of punishment. Um, and I think if people ask the right questions, they might have got the answers that they were looking for. Um, with that being said, it kind of brings me to my next point, which is about ensuring that students' needs um, are kind of addressed quickly. So in my case, um, I did have a dyslexia, which was I found out in my first year of university, um, actually the first term, the first essay I wrote. So as you can see, my tutor saw that there was something not quite right with the kind of the performance I had in class versus what I was writing in essays. In that case, she asked the right questions and made sure she understood whether or not I have some sort of underlying needs that might be unmet. So I think with that being said, it's important that a, we ask the right questions um, and we make sure that we're kind of also involving young people in the process and asking them what they need. And we're making sure that young people don't go without their needs being diagnosed and addressed. Thank you, Vanessa. Uh, and thank you to all our panellists for those really useful uh, set of reflections um, about these, these questions and the issue of early intervention. So um, we've got a question on Slido, which uh, I think speaks to an issue that came up in a number of uh, the panellists' uh, descriptions, and that is about meeting thresholds of need. Um, and the question here includes uh, the observation that often meeting thresholds of need, like the thresholds are frighteningly high. Um, Catherine, I'm inclined to come to you, actually. Um, of course, feel free to comment from a school's perspective if you like. But but my immediate thought when I think of this is, is you know, some of the sometimes disastrously high thresholds of need in regards to young people's mental health. And I wondered whether you'd be able to give us some reflections about your thoughts, firstly, on the situation with thre um, thresholds of need. Um, and secondly, you know, what, if anything, can we do about that? Um, certainly will. And without a doubt, this varies greatly right across the country. And children and young people's mental health was an area that was under invested in before the pandemic. Um, and the stats, the rec the stats have gone from one in one in nine children, young people having a, an identifiable mental health disorder and needing um, specialist input to now one in six. And we know and we can see even our, in our work and also within within the NHS in accident and emergency, we know that there are really increased alarmingly and concerningly increased numbers of especially young people with severe cases of eating disorder or self harm who are presenting. So it, it is rising. Um, I think so. It is very much on the agenda. I think some things are being put in place. Like, and finally, the government screen paper, which was about mental health support in schools, is coming and is now being somewhat accelerated, I think, to try and help and address this situation. Um, I'm thrilled that the training for the designated lead within school finally is, is about to come on stream and we should see that from the autumn onwards. In terms of, we need, and we need investment at all parts of the system within the school, the mental health support teams who should act as a mechanism to get earlier help in for lower level issues before you get to that crisis situation that we're seeing, which is what people I think generally refer to as the very high threshold levels. So we need the investment for that mid area. And that also includes services such as place to be individual counselors, the many other local organizations that work within schools, um, because the, the level of need is high, but we need effective interventions in there. But they have to be able to refer into that more specialist NHS care where that is needed as well. So we need the whole system joining up. Thank you, Catherine. Um, very, very um, 
helpful overview of, of the situation regarding mental health and how that plays out in, in schools. Christina, we've had um, a comment on, on Slido asking about investment. And obviously Catherine there was talking about, you know, the level of investment that would be needed to, you know, secure the sort of support that these young people need. Um, this isn't what Catherine said. Uh, this is what I'm I'm asking. Um, I'm not attempting to misrepresent Catherine. But is it just about investment, or is or is this more complicated than that, Christina? Uh, if only, if only it were just about investment. Um, if we could throw money at this problem, that would be one thing. But unfortunately, we have to throw relationships at this problem. We have to get parents who really understand. Uh, what their behavior, uh, how their be behavior can impact children. We have to have um, uh, a nexus of really strong and supportive relationships around a child who's seemed uh, seen to be vulnerable. Um, and uh, and in a way, one of the um, one of the issues that I think all of us are uh, are engaging with is. How do we get parents and schools to cooperate, to engage? Mm. And I have to say, um, in my own experience as uh, the founder of a small charity uh, that Will uh, alluded to, the Parenting Circle, we found that schools that have family liaison officers have been tremendously uh, useful in connecting, in building a bridge between uh, some of the most vulnerable families and the schools. Because again and again, what we found was that for many parents who are uh, struggling, who have a very disadvantaged background, school is a hostile environment. School is where they were first humiliated, where they were uh, possibly excluded. So having somebody who reinterprets school and schooling for these parents is really, really significant. But also we have to remember that although children spend a great deal of time uh, at school, it is in the family home that uh, they spend the majority of their time. And therefore we must get that aspect uh, absolutely right. And I'm sorry if my dog was barking. That's okay. Uh, there's a cat uh, meowing outside my door. So uh, it's, uh, it's all going. Um, so Christina, you mentioned the sort of the balance there of, pupil focused um, support versus drawing on family support. Claire, can I, can I come to you here? What's your sense of getting that balance right? You know, how should schools be prioritizing support for individual pupils over and above actually working with whole families? Um, yeah, what are your thoughts on that? It's, it's a tricky one to get the balance right. I mean, um, I think a helpful thing to say before fully answering this question is that it can be, as schools, we encounter so many different um, parents, parents who have you know varying views and want to engage with schools in so many different ways. And it, um, I always feel strongly that a key part of getting early intervention right is trying to get that parental communication and um, partnership working between parent and school working really well. But it, it isn't always easy. Um, but what I say to our, our schools and leaders is that we've got to embrace challenges um, and you know, we can't see them as excuses and we just need to try and find the best solutions for young people. I think we've seen a lot of success in our schools with parent support advisors um, mm. that kind of echo what Christina was saying, where we have um, brought those in or where they've been existing in, in school structures. They have been critical to building relationships with parents and actually in many ways um, getting that holistic view. So taking the views of the parents who really do know their child um, and being the person that then liaises with um, other key staff in school. Um, I think what we have to be careful about is not trying to do everything as schools um, at the end of the day we're not social workers and we can't try to be so we do have to be clear about where our remit ends but building that relationship uh, is so important i would say it's, it's an important thing to mention the 
impact of the, the pandemic has really changed in many of our schools, the relationship with many families between um, the, the school and, the, and, their, and, and their, their community. Uh, we've seen parents who haven't particularly engaged in the past, who have much more so recently because of the, the community outreach work and because of the, the closer working relationship that just had to be there during the pandemic to make sure that um, children got the support that they need, whether that was academic support or, or food or, or whatever it might be. So I do think we've seen a shift. Thank you, Claire. Vanessa, um, I'm going to pose a personal question, but feel free to just move me on if you don't want to talk about this. But you, you mentioned your experience of exclusion, and I suppose I'm wondering what you and your family felt about the support available both to you and to them while that was happening and whether you thought um, there was particular support that your family would have benefited from during that time that simply just wasn't available. Um, if you're happy to answer that, what are your thoughts? Um, sorry, do you mind repeating the first part of the question? My internet's been crackling a little bit, sorry. That's OK. It wouldn't be an online event if we didn't have some sort of connection issues. So um, actually, I think, I think you know, you're, you're making us all feel very at home. Um, so my question was, was there support that your family felt was was missing when you were going through exclusion at school? Yeah, sure. Um, I guess it's difficult for me because I feel like my exclusion, it was very much seen as a punishment. I don't think in my case there was very much support put in place. Um, so I was excluded um, on like fixed term exclusions quite a few times before the permanent one. Um, and then the same thing had happened in the second school. And at no point did anybody suggest maybe a dyslexia test or ADHD. I think a lot of it was kind of circled around or centered around punishment rather than trying to understand my needs. So I think in my case, just any support would have done. Um, I think particularly because my mum also works in education, so it was quite devastating for her to have, obviously her daughter um, struggle in education. And I think that was quite difficult. And I think there wasn't necessarily a lot of agency in the process and certainly no support. Um, so I'd probably say some sort of test at an early point um, and also probably getting us in at an earlier stage. I don't really think it should be a case of students are constantly having fixed term exclusions and then a permanent exclusion. And it's only at that point that a parent's brought in. It feels like you waited for the bad outcome before you tried to put support in place. So I'd say any support from the beginning would have been much better than what I received. Yeah, okay, thank you. Christina, I can see your hand. So um, yes. I'll come over to you. Uh, Vanessa, your, your experience um, really, uh, struck me because uh, I remember speaking in, as part of my research with um, a, a wonderful lawyer from the Howard League who said that uh, if you look at the young people in youth offending institutions, the number one memory they have is of exclusion from schools. And that really, really uh, stayed with me. And one of the, um, uh, one of the areas where um, uh, where I found there was some very important work being done to address exclusions. And in fact, over one term, they managed to reduce exclusions by a third, was in Wolverhampton, where the virtual head has adopted a whole school approach to trauma, um, uh, trauma awareness training. It's online. It's done with a couple thousand pounds, but you can share it with all the schools that are under the virtual heads remit. And, um, and it's brief, you know, it's, a, it's two days. I think that's the kind of thing that a school can offer to recognize that exclusion is just, you know, it, it's just the first step in, in a, the journey to hell. Um, Christina, thank you. Um, I want to actually delve, I want to come back to the, the uh, children's care system question. Um, but Claire, I, I can see that you want to come in at this point. So over to you. I just really wanted to echo what you're saying, Christina, about um, trauma aware practice. We've had um, huge success in a number of our schools this year um, 
with uh, school leaders that have been on an inclusive leadership course actually through The Difference, um, the charity that I work with. Um, and a key aspect of, of that training is uh, trauma aware practice. So I do think that's something that um, is really useful for schools to think about in terms of um, increasing their capacity and expertise around early intervention. Thank you, Catherine. Um, just picking up on all of that, I think the, the whole school approach or trauma informed approach, the key elements are working with the parents, working with staff in schools so that the school staff understand that behaviour is a way of communicating so that you don't end up being punished or being um, challenged for, for the behaviour. Somebody tries to understand what lies behind that and then get the support in place. We know from our work that two thirds of the children, so it's even more than that, Christina, two thirds of the children that we worked with in targeted one-to-one -one work who had fixed term exclusions, that those exclusions were reduced after they had access that targeted support. So someone had taken the time to understand, to unpick what was going on and then get the right support in place. So we can, we can change these things. It's great to um, hear something um, optimistic on that front, uh, Catherine, so thank you. Um, there's a sort of desperate irony, which is that the poorest, you know, most deprived areas in the country, the local authorities, you know, serving some of the most deprived communities. Um, there's a sort of desperate correlation between that and the likelihood that children will go into care. Um, children in the 10% of poorest boroughs are something like 10 times more likely to enter the care system than children in the richest 10 percent. Um, we know, obviously, I, I won't need to say this, that schools um, are always under, you know, financial and other capacity and resource pressures. The same is true, certainly, for social workers and social services. So we've got two incredibly important services, both uh, struggling with capacity uh, and resource. We have a question here about how schools can better link up with social services in order to ensure that children's needs are met. Um, Claire, perhaps I can come to you first on that. Um, and then Christina, I'm sure you'll have thoughts to add uh, once, once Claire has um, given us her thoughts. Yeah, I think it's I think it's really important and probably speaks to what I was saying earlier about um, not just knowing the, the individual child, but getting communication right um, and making sure that, that communication works well between all of the, the professionals involved with the child. Where, where I see this working at its best is when there's um, really productive two-way communication um, between, um, or in fact, it might be multiple agencies working with a child and that that um, is facilitated so that there is regular communication so that that holistic view can be can be understood. Um, and I think that's the key to it, really, whether mm. uh, communication, whether that's in school or, or whether that's part of multi agency working um, and sometimes realising that you know, it doesn't have to be a big issue to pick up the phone and just check in on where a child is, um, that getting that that regular um multi-agency communication right is absolutely critical. Thanks Claire. Christina, I know that you'll want to add to that. Okay, so the first thing I wanted to say is Vanessa is the reason that uh, we should have some hope because damn it, you know, two exclusions and look at you. So, you know, reason to hope, reason to be optimistic. That's the first one. The second thing is you've got coming on uh, one of your uh, next sessions, May Lynn who is um, uh, at the helm of uh, a children's hub in Felton, the Reach Felton Children's Hub. And what May has piloted uh, together with the headmaster, uh, headmaster uh, Ed Banker, is a hub that signposts, it's, it's based next to the school, so it's very much part of the school community, but it signposts to all kinds of services and delivers all kinds of services, so that it's a one-stop 
um, shop for all families. It has one door, so you can come in and be, you know, completely free of stigma. Nobody knows why you're there, but you can access all kinds of uh, services from uh, uh, breastfeeding support to domestic abuse support. And this hub idea is now being uh, is now being trialed with great government support and some government resources as family hubs. And there's already uh, an existing network of about 150 uh, family hubs which are already operational and which because they are so linked to their local areas will know who the most troubled families are, who the most uh, disadvantaged communities are. And, um, and that localization can be really, really helpful and also uh, can, uh, can offer uh, a continuous support so that the same health visitor who came and saw that uh, your and, and, and identified your child as having uh, some developmental issues will be seeing that child six months on and, and recognizing what progress has been made or, or being able to say further support is necessary. So family hubs are a new kind of new kid on the block and they might be able to really extend the reach of schools and the support given to school from, uh, from local authorities and from central government. Thanks, Christina. And I think, you know, you're, you're so right to flag those hubs um, on the basis that schools can't do everything. Um, so the more that there is, and, you know, as Claire's been saying, the more that there is that joined up approach, the better. We have a question here um, about um, schools in Asia. Uh, the question isn't more specific about the country, uh, but the thrust of the question is that um, if a school does not have any support with mental health whatsoever or access to more specialist mental health support, um, what can the teachers there do, um, particularly if they're already under constraints in terms of time? Catherine, perhaps I might send that one your way uh, to begin with. So I think that it comes back to parents and teachers all can play a part, uh, as can peers, especially as, as we go into secondary school, the, the importance of peer support as well. Um, but we also do need access to more specialist support where that is really needed. We, we can't not have, you know, the experts when you get to the much more severe issues. And um, so in order to, but it's about equipping and skilling um, a school leader, a class teacher to understand the part that they can play, or similarly a parent to understand and, and give tools and techniques in a positive non-judgmental sort of way it's not that you're a bad parent if you you know we all need I've just kind of been onto our mental our online um, foundation program we all wish you know for tips and tools in how do you deal with your child who's growing up and is incredibly di displaying incredibly challenging behavior or who won't talk to you at all who's completely mm -hmm. retreating and you can't understand what's going on so for a class teacher, it's about giving them confidence. It goes back to what Claire said earlier on, the, taking time to understand and developing a positive relationship and then beginning to unpick what might lie behind a challenge. Um, and where I, I haven't got a magic wand, where specialist support is required, specialist support is required. Um, but there is a lot that you can do as a class teacher. And that's why we developed our... One of the good things after the pandemic, we developed our online Mental Health Champions Foundation program. Um, and a member of school staff in 42% of schools around the country has accessed it. So schools are ready for this. And through technology and online programs, just as Christina mentioned for parents, we can do a lot. Thank you, Catherine, for that. Um, in a second, um, I'm gonna ask our four panelists to um, give us the one, the one thing that they want teachers listening to this to do tomorrow. 
um, in terms of um, you know enacting some of these these key messages about early intervention. So just forewarning to the panel that 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 question is coming your way. Just before I do pose that, Claire, I'm, I'm going to frame a deliberately uh, provocative question to you, which is that it seems to me this isn't just about a sort of you know a single crisis point in a young person's life that's missed. It's multiple opportunities to intervene that perhaps are missed or aren't dealt with properly throughout a young person's life. Um, so if we extend that logic, is this more the responsibility of primary schools than secondary, would you say? I think it's really difficult to give that um, a firm answer. I, I do think if we're talking about early intervention, then of course that needs to start as early as possible. And the example I gave at the start was about um, a child transferring from nursery into uh, reception. So I think we do need to see that the need for intervention can be as, as young as that. Um, but earlier I highlighted the importance of transition. And I think for me, rather than saying this is about a primary or a secondary priority. I would rather um, focus on the role that transition points play, because I think that is when um, things can go wrong for young people. And we need to be really vigilant and know when to spot the early warning signs. And I do think that, um, I mean, it's an area of work that I'm really interested in, and I think schools. Um, would really like to do more around how to mitigate um, th those potential um, risk points when um, things can start to go wrong um, for children. So I don't know if that quite answers your question well. I'm kind of saying it's I'm kind of saying it's both. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I think I think you have Claire, and I think you know obviously it will depend on on what is happening in that young person's life but no I think I think you have you have addressed that um so we have a few minutes left and as I say I'm going to come to the panel now to give me the one thing that they would encourage I certainly don't want to give the impression we're assuming schools aren't doing this but the one thing that they would encourage schools to be doing teachers listening to this to be doing tomorrow the one thing um so uh, Christina if I come to you first I think the teacher should look at the child who's not speaking to anybody, look at the child who's misbehaving, look at the child who is like the disruptor in their class and ask why. Why this behavior? Don't punish. Ask why. Thank you, Christina. Catherine, can I come to you next? Uh, I think I'd say firstly, look after yourself. Um, don't feel like you have to be the expert in mental health, but look after yourself because the our teams talk about the oxygen mask, put on the oxygen mask for yourself and do something for yourself. Uh, and if you want to know more about it, our free online mental health champions program is on our website, sign yourself up, and and that will help you learn a bit more about it if you feel that you need to but don't feel you have to be an expert thanks catherine and you know as as we said previously it's great to know that that support is is available so thank you for flagging that um vanessa if i come to you next what is it that you'd like to see oh I think Vanessa's uh, Wi-Fi may have got the better of us. So, Claire, if I come to you. So, I, I think schools always want and intend to do the best for their young people. But I, what I would urge people to just think about um, in their schools is whether the structures and systems that are in place really support and facilitate information sharing about everything that is, is going on with the child in school. So, you know, pastoral staff speaking to safeguarding staff, speaking to form tutors, speaking to subject teachers. Um, just think about whether your systems and structures facilitate that working really well. Thank you, Claire. And Vanessa, in about 
five to ten seconds, if your Wi-Fi permits, what's the one thing you'd like to see? I don't know if you're back with us. I did see movement. No, I think Vanessa's Wi-Fi uh, has, has cut her out, but it was fantastic having her contributions. Um, thank you so much to the panellists. I can't really say enough how, how great it's been having your very varied uh, perspectives and input today. Um, once again, to flag Christina's publication out tomorrow, that really powerful collection of essays. And thank you very much for listening. It's my great honour to welcome you all. It is a very prestigious award. It means the world to me. have great senses of humour. I like to reveal parts of history to them for I love making history come alive. They are some of the best people that you can come across. To help them open their hearts. I always come back to this quote. How can we be role models to learners if we're not learners ourselves? It's quite useful to get out of our bubbles, not our COVID ones, and sort of see what else is out there. By sharing best practice, we can see the whole picture. We can see what really matters. to forget how much has to happen behind the front lines. As a global schools group, Cognita educates over 55,000 students across 12 countries. We're proud to be wellbeing partner at this year's Festival of Education, and we want to share the work that we're doing to prioritise children's well-being. This starts with a clear understanding of what well-being is. We looked at the evidence and created a simple Be Well Charter that everyone can use day to day. It gives a clear definition of well-being and then focuses on the specific contributors that influence it. Discover our full Be Well Charter video and other resources to use with your students and families at cognita.com. I really try to not look at myself as just a science teacher. I feel like as a teacher, it's, it's very important to help students grow and develop outside of your lessons. A single teacher believing in you and really believing in you. One teacher in doing that can have a large impact, but if you have one or two or three all telling you that and really, really believing in it, it makes you feel like you can achieve anything in the world, honestly.